In chapter 26, we will examine fluid, electrolyte, and acid-base balance of the body. Here's a picture of Venus Williams preparing on the tennis court. And this illustrates the concept that the body does have critically important mechanisms for balancing the intake and output of bodily fluids. An athlete, such as Venus Williams, must continually replace water and electrolytes that are lost in sweat. Let's look at body fluids and fluid compartments. Water is the largest single component of the body. Males are about 60% water and 40% solid materials, while women or females are about 50% water and 50% solid materials. Fat is essentially free of water, meaning it's hydrophobic. The less fat present corresponds to a greater percentage of body weight due to water. Adipose tissue is 20% hydrated, while skeletal muscle is 65% water. And you can see varying percentages of water from an early embryo to an elderly person. The water content of the body is shown here. And you can see the water content varies in different body organs and tissues. Fluid compartments of the human body are shown here. The intracellular fluid compartment, or ICF, is the fluid within the body cells, such as cytosol, nucleoplasm, the matrix of mitochondria, and so forth. It's usually around 33% in men and 27% in women. The extracellular fluid compartment, or ECF, is that fluid found outside of cells and contains the interstitial fluid which is the fluid in the microscopic spaces between cells, the intravascular fluid, which is the fluid in the portion of blood plasma and located within blood vessels, and other fluid like lymph, cerebral spinal fluid, humors of the eye, synovial fluid, serous fluids, and even secretions of the gastrointestinal tracts. The proportion of total body fluid is shown here. Most of the water in the body is the intracellular fluid. The second largest volume is the interstitial that surrounds cells. Composition of body fluids is shown here. Solutes can be classified as being electrolytes or non-electrolytes. Electrolytes are molecules that disassociate in solution to form charged particles called ions, rendering the solution capable of conducting an electrical current. Examples are salts, acids, and bases. Two types of ions can be produced from electrolytes. Cations, which is an ion carrying a positive charge, and anions, which is an ion carrying a negative charge. Non-electrolytes are molecules that have covalent bonds that prevent them from disassociating in solution. And examples would be proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, and urea. Non-electrolytes are far more abundant than electrolytes. Here are some of the electrolytes of the body and mechanisms of absorption. Sodium can be actively transported, co-transported, or via channel-mediated diffusion, for example. And this slide shows some of the elements in key bodily fluids. When you compare extracellular and intracellular fluids, we're looking at 
blood plasma and interstitial fluids, which are both components of the extracellular fluid, and they are very similar except that protein levels are higher in blood because they are too large to diffuse into and out of capillary vessels. Blood plasma and interstitial fluids, or ECF, have increased sodium cations and increased chloride anions. Intracellular fluids have increased potassium cations and increased um, phosphate anions. Now fluid can move between compartments and capillary exchange is shown here on the slide. Blood plasma circulates throughout the body and links the external and internal environments as well as the ICF and ECF. In an earlier chapter we talked about the exchange at the capillary bed and you should recall that increased hydrostatic pressure at the arterial end of the capillary bed forces fluid and substances out of the blood vessels and into the interstitial spaces. Decreased hydrostatic pressure while colloid osmotic pressure at the venous end of the capillary bed and this is due to those impassable plasma proteins does not change and creates a suction of fluid into the blood vessel and out of the interstitial spaces. Movements from the interstitial spaces to intracellular compartments are more complex because of the selective permeability of membranes. Water flows freely in and out as a, as a response to concentration gradients and the movement of nutrients, respiratory gases, and waste can be unidirectional. Nutrients and oxygen de generally move towards and into cells, and metabolic waste and carbon dioxide move out and away from cells. Now there are many other transport mechanisms that you have learned about in ANP1 for the movement of electrolytes and non-electrolytes and those are shown here for your review. Facilitated diffusion is a form of passive transport where substances are transported down their concentration gradient with a carrier protein or channel. Primary active transport or the sodium potassium pump is shown here and that is where we transport three sodium ions out of the cell and two potassium ions into the cell against their concentration gradient with the assistance of ATP. And other forms of active transport are secondary active transport and various forms of vesicular transport like endocytosis and exocytosis. Now let's look at the water balance of the body. Water balance is regulated by hormones and does depend on sodium balance. Remember to remain properly hydrated, obligatory water output must be balanced with water intake. Various forms of obligatory water output are urine production, evaporation via the skin, evaporation via the lungs, water is also lost in feces, and water intake occurs via solid foods, liquids and beverages, and metabolic water which occurs through the metabolism of our foods. This chart shows the thirst response.
and you can see if there is insufficient water in the body that will lead to a reduction in blood volume and an increase in blood osmolality. A reduction in blood volume lowers blood pressure and can stimulate angiotensin II, which will stimulate the thirst center in the hypothalamus as well, increase our thirst so that we take in water and decrease our blood osmolality. That increase in blood osmolality can also stimulate the osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus as well as simply having a dry mouth. The primary hormone regulating water balance is antidiuretic hormone or ADH. Antidiuretic hormone, recall, is produced by the hypothalamus but is secreted by the posterior pituitary where it is stored. When blood volume decreases, ADH is secreted by the posterior pituitary. This enhances facultative water reabsorption in the kidney tubules, which leads to increased extracellular fluid volumes. If blood volumes are too high, ANP, atrial natriuretic peptide, is secreted by the atrium of the heart and blocks the secretion of ADH, which causes and increases in urine output and a drop in extracellular fluid volumes. Aquaporins can also lead to um, water balances in the body. Aquaporins are water channels. The binding of ADH to receptors on the cells of the collecting tubule result in aquaporins being inserted into the plasma membrane and this allows for that facultative water reabsorption to occur at the kidney under the influence of ADH. Disturbances in water balance can also occur. So if fluid balance is not maintained, we can have a disorder, disease, or even death. Dehydration develops when water losses outpace water gains. Causes might include hemorrhage, severe burns, excessive vomiting and diarrhea, profuse sweating, water deprivation, or diuretic abuse. Prolonged dehydration causes body cells to crenate because the extracellular fluid is so concentrated meaning it's hypertonic to the body cells. Diabetes insipidus is a chronic dehydration due to the hyposecretion of ADH. Or hypotonic hydration develops when water gains outpace water losses. This is rare because typically healthy kidneys will excrete excess water as a component of urine. If, however, there is some type of kidney failure or water retention disorder, the water may accumulate in the extracellular fluid, causing it to become diluted, hypotonic, compared to the body cells. This in turn could result in the lysis of body cells as massive amounts of water moves from the ECF into the ICF. Now let's look at electrolyte balance, which is the mineral balance and involving electrolyte gains and losses. Electrolyte balance occurs as a result of the regulation of sodium, potassium, chloride, calcium, and phosphate. Regulation of sodium is shown here and sodium is regulated by aldosterone and ANP. Other hormones can also contribute like estrogen, progesterone, or glucocorticoids. Aldosterone increases sodium reabsorption in the kidney tubules. Aldosterone is secreted by the zona glomerulosa 
of the adrenal cortex when sodium levels are too low and targets the kidneys so that potassium release falls, sodium is reabsorbed, and sodium potassium blood levels normalize. The renin angiotensin system can also stimulate the release of aldosterone from the adrenal cortex. And ANP can reduce sodium reabsorption. When plasma sodium levels are too high, ANP secreted by the atrium of the heart blocks the secretion of aldosterone and that causes a reduction in sodium reabsorption. Potassium is primarily regulated by concentration maximums but can be affected by hormones. Remember potassium moves opposite to sodium and potassium can be regulated by aldosterone. As aldosterone stimulates sodium reabsorption, it increases potassium secretion into the kidney tubules and therefore it is lost in our urine. As A and P blocks sodium reabsorption, it can in turn decrease potassium secretion into the tubules and can even enhance potassium reabsorption. Potassium imbalances are uncommon but can be extremely dangerous. Chloride movements are also tied to sodium movements. Chloride follows sodium. As sodium is reabsorbed by aldosterone, chloride would also be reabsorbed. As sodium reabsorption is blocked by A and P, chloride reabsorption would also be blocked. Calcium is regulated by PTH and calcitonin. PTH or parathyroid hormone raises blood calcium when it is too low. PTH is secreted by the chief cells of the parathyroid glands when calcium levels drop. PTH stimulates osteoclast to break down bone and release stored calcium. It also increases the absorption of calcium from food through the digestive tract and also increases the reabsorption of calcium from the tubular filtrate in the kidneys. Calcitonin lowers blood calcium when it is too high. Calcitonin is secreted by the parafollicular cells, also known as the C-cells, of the thyroid gland. Calcitonin stimulates the action of osteoblast to build new osteoids and store excess calcium into the newly formed bone. And here you can see those two mechanisms of PTH and phosphate is regulated by PTH and calcitonin in an opposite way to calcium movements. PTH lowers blood phosphate levels and calcitonin raises blood phosphate levels. When electrolyte balance is lost, disorders can result, such as hypernatremia or hyponatremia, which would be too high or too low levels of sodium. Now let's look at acid-base balance. The pH scale is shown here and you should recall from A and P2 what an acid base and the pH scale is. The pH, remember, is a logarithmic scale of the hydrogen ion concentration in a solution. A solution with a pH of 7 contains equal numbers of hydrogen and hydroxide ions. Some examples of various pH concentrations of solutions are shown here you can see the hydrochloric acid of the stomach lining has a pH of 1 while 
a ammonium solution has a pH of 11 and would be considered basic. A base is an electrolyte that releases hydroxide ions when in solution and an acid is an electrolyte that releases hydrogen ions when in solution. Here is another view of the pH scale showing you acidic and basic concentrations. If something has a pH below 7, it is called an acid, and if the pH of the blood plasma, for example, falls below 7.35, we would call that acidosis. The pH of our blood is above 7.45, we would call that alkalosis. Some various terminology related to acid-base balance is shown here for your review. Make sure you understand the definition of pH, neutral, acidic, basic, acid, base, salt, and buffer. Some other terms to be familiar with are defined here for you. Strong acids versus weak acids. Strong acids completely disassociate in solution like hydrochloric acid. A weak acid does not completely disassociate in solution like carbonic acid and therefore only partially ionizes, meaning it leaves much of the um, carbonic acid intact in solution, therefore releasing less hydrogen ions than a strong acid like hydrochloric acid does in solution. There are various classes of acids. Three classes of acids can threaten our pH balance, fixed acids, organic acids, and volatile acids. Fixed acids are acids that do not leave solution. Once produced, they will remain in body fluids until they are eliminated at the kidneys. Examples include sulfuric acid, phosphoric acid, which are generated in small amounts during the catabolism of amino acids or phosphate-containing compounds such as phospholipids and nucleic acids. Organic acids are acids that are participants in or byproducts of cellular metabolism. Examples include lactic acid from the anaerobic metabolism of pyruvate and ketone bodies from the incomplete cat catabolism of lipid derivatives. Most are metabolized rapidly so that significant accumulation does not occur. And volatile acids are acids that can leave the body by entering the atmosphere at the lungs. Examples include carbonic acid, which forms by interaction between water and carbon dioxide. Respiratory regulation of blood pH is shown here. If an acid-base imbalance is detected, for example, the pH falls, we would be considered acidotic. This would stimulate brain and arterial receptors to increase our respiration rate to therefore decrease the blood concentrations of carbon dioxide, which would decrease the blood concentrations of carbonic acid, which would allow the pH to rise and homeostasis restored. If our blood pH is increased, meaning we are in an alkalosis state, that would also stimulate our brain and arterial receptors to lower our respiratory rate, which would increase the concentrations in our blood of carbon dioxide and carbonic acid and lower the pH, thereby restoring homeostasis. 
So the respiratory system can impact the pH of the blood by either increasing or decreasing blood concentrations of carbonic, uh, carbon dioxide and carbonic acid. In addition, the kidneys can conserve bicarb. The tubular cells of the kidneys are not permeable to bicarbonate. Thus, bicarbonate is conserved rather than reabsorbed. We also have various chemical buffers in the body. Chemical buffers can temporarily store hydrogen ions and thereby provide short-term pH stability, but they cannot prevent pH shifts in the intracellular or extracellular fluids. Three major chemical buffering systems are the phosphate buffer system, protein buffer system, and carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system, which happens to be the most important in the extracellular fluid. The carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system is the major extracellular buffering system. Sodium bicarbonate functions as a weak base. Carbonic acid functions as a weak acid. Hydrochloric acid, of course, is a strong acid and when combined with Sodium bicarbonate forms a weak acid, carbonic acid, and sodium chloride, which is a salt. The phosphate buffer system is the most important chemical buffering system in the ICF and urine. Monohydrogen phosphate functions as a weak base. Dihydrogen phosphate functions as a weak acid in this scenario. So we also get the formation of a weak acid and a salt when hydrochloric acid combines with monohydrogen phosphate. And hemoglobin buffers, CO2 from our cells and water in our plasma can form carbonic acid, which disassociate to bicarb and hemoglobin bound to our red blood cells along with hydrogen. Protein buffers are the most abundant buffering system in the body because they can function both in the intracellular and extracellular components. Carboxyl groups act as a weak acid by releasing hydrogen ions in solution, and the amine groups can act as a weak base. We also have physiological buffering systems. The lungs and kidneys are important physiological buffers and are important for maintaining pH balance in the body and compensating for acid-base imbalances. Metabolic acidosis, for example, would be due to a decrease in bicarb and can be caused by excessive alcohol consumption, untreated diabetes, starvation, prolonged diarrhea, or renal dysfunction. A drop in bicarb levels will lower blood pH. So the compensation would be hyperventilation by the lungs, and reabsorption of bicarb and secretion of hydrogen ions by the kidneys. Metabolic alkalosis would be the opposite. It would be due to an increase in bicarb, which increases pH and could be caused by excessive vomiting, diuretic abuse, gastric suctioning, ingestion of excessive sodium bicarb, or excess aldosterone. The compensatory mechanism would be hypoventilation by the lungs and reabsorption of hydrogen ions 
and secretion of bicarb by the kidneys. Respiratory acidosis would be the result of an increase in carbon dioxide due to hypoventilation. Causes could include shallow breathing, chronic bronchitis, emphysema, cystic fibrosis, narcotic or barbiturate use. That increased CO2 concentration will lead to a decreased pH. So the compensation would be reabsorption of bicarb and secretion of hydrogen ions by the kidneys and, if possible, hyperventilation. Respiratory alkalosis would be the result of a decrease in carbon dioxide levels in the blood due to hyperventilation. So decreased carbon dioxide would lead to an increased pH. This could be caused by strong emotions, hypoxia, a brain tumor, or injury. The body would compensate by reabsorbing hydrogen ions and secretion of bicarb by the kidneys and, if possible, hypoventilation. Finally, let's look at some disorders. Edema is an allergic reaction and can cause capillaries in the hand, for example, to leak excess fluid that accumulates in the tissues. Some of the symptoms of acidosis and alkalosis are noted here. Symptoms of acidosis can affect various organ systems of the body as well as symptoms of alkalosis. Homeostatic imbalances are noted here, hypernatremia, hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, hypokalemia. So you would have imbalances in sodium or potassium or hyperphosphatemia or hypophosphatemia, imbalances in phosphate levels. You can have imbalances in your chlorine levels calcium, um, magnesium, or even protein. So either too high or too low in electrolytes, if they're lost, a disorder can result. And mineral imbalances are noted here for you. So for example, calcium is needed for several organ systems of the body. Deficiencies can lead to things like osteoporosis, impaired growth, or muscle spasms. Or, if you have too much, it can impact your neural function, your muscles, or even your kidneys. And then abnormalities in acid-base balance, like metabolic acidosis, alkalosis, which I just talked about, are shown here for you, as well as respiratory acidosis and alkalosis. And there's a chart here that you can fill out looking at the pH associated with each of these conditions, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, bicarb, potential causes, and possible compensatory mechanisms of the body. This concludes Chapter 26, Fluid, Electrolyte, and Acid-Base Balance.